last August, um, I, like many of you, I'm sure, were sitting and watching the news and hearing about refugees or migrants uh, flocking, swarming, coming to invade our country. And there was a huge focus on Calais and the men in Calais and terrible dehumanizing things being said about these, these people. And I thought of my grandmother, who was a refugee. She left from Russia, and she left because her and her family were Jews. And I thought about them being refugees, and, and you know they were normal, everyday people, and they went on to do wonderful things with their lives. And I, I, f I found it really hard to accept. Oh, I haven't even turned the time over. <laughs> Sorry. I found it really hard to accept what, what the media seemed to be saying, or certain factions of the media. And I noticed on Facebook that a, an old teacher of mine called Tom um, was decided to go to Calais for himself and he was going to try and bring some clothes and he wanted to raise a thousand pounds so I said to myself well I'll help you and a couple of my friends JC and Dawn and I said let's get do this together we can raise a thousand pounds and we can get a van load of goods and we can drive to Calais and we'll drop the goods off and we'll have done our good deed for the day and we can pat ourselves on the back and go back to our lives feeling like we've done something good so that was the plan and we set up a hashtag called hashtag help Calais and we started tweeting and going on social media. And we hired um, one storage room in Big Yellow Storage in Finchley in London. And within one week, we had 56,000 pounds. And we had 15 rooms full to the brim of goods. And not just donated goods. We set up a wish list online on an online store. And we had at one point 7,000 packages arriving every single day to the storeroom. And what that did for us was make us realize that it, this is something that a lot of people in this country are feeling, that they feel much more compassion towards these people than our government or our media were giving us credit for, in fact. And uh, the storage room where we were keeping our goods rang us up and they said, um, girls, uh, you've got 7,000 packages coming tomorrow morning. You might want to get some volunteers down here because there's only one guy at the moment helping you and we're not doing it. <laughs> So um, we started getting volunteers together and getting teams of volunteers, and suddenly this kind of little good deed we'd hoped to do started spiralling. And as I said, we had these huge, huge, huge 15 rooms. We were meant to send one truck or one lorry, and we had enough for at least 10 Arctic lorries at this point. So um, we thought to ourselves, you know, we better go to Calais, actually, and check that they can take all these goods, because we don't really know what's there. So we thought that was a good idea. So we jumped in our cars and drove to Calais, and we were honestly absolutely shocked by what we found there because there was no one helping there was no NGOs there was no government presence there was this incredible group of volunteers British people French people helping these 6,000 people women children men old people from all walks of life there was over 15 nationalities there there was architects we met doctors teachers pro footballers animators you know it was not at all what we expected and there was no warehouse to send these goods. There was no distribution network. There was no volunteer program. There was a local charity called Auberge de Migrants. Absolutely incredible people. Retired, mostly teachers and artists who were trying six of them to care for 6,000 people and then these little pockets of volunteers. So we just thought to ourselves, we can't walk away. We cannot just leave. And we certainly can't bring all these goods here. There's nowhere to put them. The people were sort of dumping them on the ground and meaning that the residents in this makeshift camp were sort of scrabbling for goods. It was completely undignified. And there were children living in tents, and winter was coming. You know, this is coming to autumn now. People were going to potentially freeze to death. So we walked around and we spoke to people, and one of the first people I met was um, a man from Afghanistan, and he told me his story. He was so kind, invited me to sit and have tea with him, even though he had nothing to offer me, but he, you know, everything he had he gave, basically made us tea, and told us how he had worked as a, a crane operator in Afghanistan. And when the British and the American forces had come, he had been on, you know, on our side, <laughs> and he wanted to help, and he worked for our forces. And when they left, he suddenly was targeted, and he was shot by the Taliban. And he had a young daughter, five months old, and a wife, and he knew they had to leave. And so... His wife managed to get asylum in the UK because she had an uncle here, and she actually was living in Wembley at this point with his daughter. He was stuck in Calais. He hadn't seen them for a year and a half. It had taken him that long to get to Calais. And at that point, I just realised this, this is our problem. This is all of our problems. So many of my friends are saying, oh, it's France's problem, it's Greece's problem, it's Syria's problem, it's Sudan's problem. 
but it was all of our problem. And he really opened my eyes to the fact that we are all in this together. Um, so we got him an iPhone and he managed to actually see his daughter who he hadn't seen for a year and a half. He'd spoken to her, but not actually seen her face on a video iPhone for the first time in a year and a half, which was lovely. And we got to work, basically. We joined forces with Auberge de Migron. We hired a huge warehouse. And within about 10 minutes of getting the keys, people started arriving. Someone had put the address on Facebook. And um, all these huge lorries from Belgium and Brussels and, uh, I don't know, Denmark started arriving. And we were sort of standing there going, uh, we have no shelves, we have no things, we have nothing. So we ran around sticking on the wall, like signs which we were just writing in marker pen, you know, food, um, sleeping bags, tents, and just kind of pointing everyone. And suddenly people started turning up, you know, volunteers. And they wanted to help as well. And it became this incredible organic system that grew over the months where people would show up. We set up a volunteer program and they'd turn up and they'd say, how can we help? And the, the organization would grow, listening to the refugees themselves in the camp about how we could serve them, help them, and how we could work with them. We set up distribution networks. We started a shelter building program and mobilized anyone who wanted to build, you know, carpentry, builder. Maybe you'd have held a hammer in your life. You could come along and join. And we managed to build with the help of all these incredible groups from across the UK coming over, over 1,500 shelters by Christmas, which was much needed because it got to minus five degrees. And um, with the state of emergency in France after the terrible Paris attacks, it meant that the humanitarian laws, which mean when you get to a certain point, minus four degrees, I think it is, you have to take anyone sleeping outside in, indoors. That was no longer the case. So uh, these shelters literally save lives. Um, the work in Calais has continued. We have an incredible team now of people there, and as I said, it grows in very organically. We've been supporting a youth centre set up by two young men in their early 20s who just came and built a small heart and called it a youth centre. We support the Unaccompanied Women and Children's Centre run by a very inspirational woman called Liz Clegg. Looks after all sorts of amazing children, women, and helps them and registers the unaccompanied children and looks after them and provides them with a sort of maternal support, I suppose. There's currently 700 children in Calais and 544 of them are on their own. We also started working in Greece and, and this happened a little bit by accident too. Everything happened slightly by accident. I was on air uh, one night and they mentioned earlier, I'm a radio DJ by trade, so no experience at all in humanitarian work. And I was on air and um, a friend of mine who was visiting in Lesbos to see how he could help rang me up. And he said, he's in this camp in the north of um, Lesbos called M Moria. And there was no one there. There was five volunteers and about 6,000 refugees in terrible conditions. And I, he was in an absolute state of shock. And I said, look, what, what can we do? What's the one thing we can do? And he said, you need to get someone here who can cook food. That's They have no food. There's the mothers fighting over sandwiches for their babies. You need to get someone here to get food. And I'm sitting there doing a radio show in Leicester Square going, how am I going to get someone to get food? And about this, exactly at this moment, I get a, an email in my Facebook, and I'd written an article about two weeks earlier for Huffington Post. We had sent um, 30 doctors on planes because we'd got a Facebook post from a girl saying, help, we need doctors in Lesbos. So we'd offered, we'd said, anyone who's a medical person who wants to go, we'll pay for your flights. And one of the doctors who went out there had rang us the next day and she was again in a state of shock. And she said, I don't know what to do. The children's feet here are rotting. It's so wet. I, I don't know what to do anymore. You have one month and these, these people are all dead. So I was, we, I was sitting there with my friends going, you know, how are we going to deal with that kind of responsibility? So the only thing I knew how to do was to write an article. So I did. So back to me being on air <laughs> and wondering how we're going to get hot food. And this email pops up in my inbox. And it's this guy, and he says, hi, I've just read your article from Huffington Post. My name's Sam. I run something called the Bristol Skipchen. Some of you may know. A waste kitchen in Bristol, which uh, has been taking waste food from supermarkets and feeding the homeless. How can I help you? And I was like, uh, hi, I never met you before, but uh, do you fancy going to Lesbos? And he was like, yeah, sure. I said, do you um, fancy getting a van and like turning it into a kitchen and maybe just setting up a kitchen there and cooking hot food for thousands of refugees every single day? And he went, yeah, sure, no problem. Literally like that. Within three days, uh, he had bought a, an old police van. He had converted it into a kitchen. He'd got a team of six people. They drove to Lesbos. 
they didn't just set up a kitchen, they also built an entire huge area, flawed, canvas, dry area for people to get dry, they could register, they could eat food. Uh, that was the beginning of Sam's work with us in Greece. He's now moved to Athens, and um, they feed thousands of people every day in the port. They make wraps. We support them, help refugees do all we can to support them. Uh, they've just opened up a center for unaccompanied minors in Athens. And the work has just expanded on and on and on from there. And I think really it's, it's not me, it's not my friends who started this whole journey. We, what we did was catch a wave. You know, It was a movement that was going on anyway. A huge amount of people with a huge amount of compassion who were just so excited to have this way to help. They were kept ringing us, you know, phones, emails, texts, tweets, just how can we help? And we would just provide them with some kind of a structure and the support that they needed to do this incredible work. So it's really them and the refugees who've shown such resilience through this, who we've learned so much from, and that are the true heroes here, actually. Today, Help Refugees are working in 22 camps in northern Greece. We do all sorts of things. We provide baby milk, we provide bread, we provide water, we build shaded areas because it's very hot, sun cream, mosquito repellent. We support child-friendly spaces where they can learn and wash, um, showers in the port for women, all sorts. We work in Athens. We continue today to be the largest providers of aid alongside our partners, Herbege de Micron, in Calais. And we support work in Turkey, Lebanon, and Paris as well. But what we're doing is nowhere near enough, nowhere near enough. What we're doing is, is great. You know, humanitarian aid is needed, and way more than on the level that we're able to do. But we're putting a tiny plaster on a huge wound. And giving people food and handing them clothes is one thing, but people need dignity and they need a, a real life. Children need education. And the answer is not just keeping them in these camps and giving them humanitarian aid, as we've been doing. There needs to be a change in consciousness. There needs to be a change in the way that we view our fellow human being. And there needs to be pressure from all of us, each of you in this room, to our local MPs, our councils, our governments, to show a kind of policy towards people who really do need our help. Because it could be us one day. It, it really could be. We don't know what's going to happen with climate change and with the way the world is going. <laughs> who knows? And we could rely on someone else having kindness towards us one day. But we can't just keep them there and keep sending them aid. We have to find better solutions. And just one example, the government promised as part of a uh, lobbying campaign that we joined with Citizens UK on, they promised to take unaccompanied children. And 10,000 children have gone missing on their own in Europe. And that was just in January, so it's probably a lot more by now. And we haven't taken a single one. They haven't. Citizens UK have managed to get 35 in through some sort of legal means, but the government haven't done it off their own accord. And, and we have the power, we really do, to write to our local MPs, to lobby and to say that that is not good enough. It really isn't. So <laughs> I wanted to end by saying that what we're doing is not enough. We can all do more, but you can, you can do more too. If, if I, a radio DJ who literally had no idea what I was doing, and you know this incredible group and team that has built around us, um, and all these volunteers, many of whom are very young and really had little or no experience can do this, then you can make this difference too because no one needs permission to get involved in this refugee crisis. It is the greatest humanitarian crisis of our generation. And no one needs permission to show compassion in new ways to their fellow man, woman, and child. And no one needs permission to help refugees. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add, because I've got a tiny bit of time left, <laughs> I just wanted to add a few ways, I know this isn't part of the talk, but I just wanted to add a couple of ways people can actually practically help us. Is that okay? We've set up something, um, we found an incredible campsite company online called leisurefair.com, and we've set up a system with them where you can literally buy a sleeping bag or a pair of boots or a blanket or a tent, and we don't touch any of the money, nothing comes through us, and all it, that good, that 
<laughs> good, that item, will turn up in our warehouse in Calais and will be distributed and will be in a refugee's hands. So it's a very direct way. It's a new way of working. You know, there's no big structure this is going through. This is you buying a sleeping bag and it will be in someone's hands about a week later. Um, you can also volunteer if you have some time, even just for a day. You just have to email volunteeringcalais at gmail.com and you can send goods yourself by driving them. It's only a day trip away. You can come to Calais and you just have to email calaisdonations at gmail.com to book in and we always welcome people there. If you cook, come and cook in our kitchens. If you can hold a saw, come and do some building. There's so much work that can be done and, and you can all be involved in that. Thank you.